we talked about in the morning to bear um, on the everyday life of people in cities and some of the ways in which we might approach doing that. Um, the first presenter is Evan Westbang, and I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Evan is a principal of the Interaction Design Practice Bangler in Oslo, where he specializes in concept development, user interface design, and data visualization. Uh, Evan has asked to characterize himself very briefly for <laughs> the presentation, and so I turn the floor over to you, my friend. Thank you. Cheers. Um, for some reason, the uh, the mini bio was was lost. Um, I would just like to have a sort of brief preamble to my talk because I am the I'm the first person here today that worked with data in silico, not with sort of not with the not with a sort of a, a an explicit rooted activist context. So I would just like to say that other projects that we do, I've just spent six years of my life working with the Norwegian local press, working with 80 local newspapers, trying to get them to attend to the readers in new, in new ways. And there's also another project that we're doing with the local councils in Norway. In Norway, when doing rezoning, you have to find out how children actually use areas. Uh, so we're working on making tools to make it easier for local municipalities to actually see how children use the urban areas. So, now, pretty pictures of numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, my talk today is called uh, Making Plans. Um, and this is really an excursion to the archives of the Oslo mm -hmm. Planning Authority. Uh, two years ago, I was engaged in a project called Durban at the, at the School of Architecture in Oslo, where the, the mandate of the mandate that I had was to go off and look at data about the city and see if it could, could be turned back around into tools for the citizens to use. And I thought it would be a nice idea to look at the archives of the planning authority. And I think it's, I think they're interesting because, I mean, there aren't that many capital intensive sectors of society that have such verbose paper <laughs> trails. And given the appellation pro process, they also encode conflict and strife. They encode the disagreements that people have when the city is made and remade. And there's also a, another reason, and that's that um, Oslo is currently being remade by these, by these large harbor front uh, development projects. And I really wanted to just go off and look at these archives to see if there's a sort of a messier reality to how these things get built. Uh, than these renderings from the objects. So this is the point of departure uh, for this project. This is the municipal page uh, where anyone can go in and look at uh, one specific case. So I know you can't read this, but at, at the very top it says which means the number of your case. Uh, and it wants a seven-digit code. And uh, that's and it's for that it's it's excellent it's fine. Uh, but if you don't have a seven digit code, if you would like to see sort of what's generally going on, it's more difficult, right? Uh, how do you how do you get at that? So I thought that there might be some opportunity here for sort of lateral engagement and play. Uh, so I built this this crawler that goes off and reads all of their documents in three sort of weeks. Uh, it, it's, it's very particular in that it tries to materialize the exact same da database that they have on my laptop also, so that I can do whatever I actually want. So it's 103,000 cases and 168,000 letters and 1.8 million uh, attachments. It's everything going from 2001 till 2012. So it's, it's geolocated data, so the first thing you do is you always draw it, draw it on maps and you can see Wow, so data, so dense. <laughs> and it's quite, it's quite interesting. This is the municipal boundary between Oslo and, and, the, and, the, and the neighboring municipality. And you can actually see where the border is, which is quite sort of... So this is a heat map. It shows you where people live. So you can do things like this. But um, So the next question here, of course, what stories should we be looking for in data sets such as these. Well, one candidate is, uh, of course, the inner life of an organization. And uh, to be a bit provocative uh, and to show how contentious data like this can be, you can use it for things like uh, this. You can be like a renegade management consultant and calculate efficiency in my metrics. These are the, this is the average time between 
pairs of incoming and outgoing mail per caseworker. And I'm not saying this is a good idea, I, right? But it's possible, right? <laughs> in the public record. Or is it maybe a city rendered in bureaucratic pro pro process? Or why might we be able to make tools here to show the epic ongoing struggle between capital politics and citizens? So, cities, a series of probes and prototypes uh, were, were sort of built. This is not a final list. If anyone has any ideas as to what they would like to see, I'm all ears. Okay? So, uh, most banal and obligatory exercise is uh, what if we could see these cases in urban space? So, you walk around these new harbor, 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 these new harbor front developments and you pull out your smartphone and there in glorious augmented reali re reality are the actual cases, right? And this one is lucky because there's even a little picture here of what the planners want this place to actually look like. And it's interesting in terms of reading because it resituates this data in the actual landscape. Now, technology like this looks better in stills than it does in actual <laughs> real life. Uh, it's not actually that good. It's glitchy and horrible and almost, almost doesn't work. But uh, there's an interesting aspect to it. Sort of when going for a Sunday stroll, you could point out a hole and this can tell you what's going to be there in six months' time. And that does feel pretty weird and strange and science is and fictional. So uh, the next, uh, next thing takes as its point of departure an omission in the archives. And probably for reasons of sensitivity, they've sort of redacted the names of parties. You can't search for anyone that has been mentioned in any of the correspondence. So that's not, not uh, possible, possible. I've sent uh, letters to them, but it doesn't find me. So <laughs> next thing is networks. So I have 159,000 par parties, either caseworkers, entrepreneurs, individuals, architects, and public aid agencies. So this is kind of going back to the work that we saw here um, from Istanbul. What if we could see who was, in, uh, who was involved in the making of a case like uh, this? So in Looking at this, oh, you know, uh, it's yeah. too... No, no, no. Right. Yeah, it's still, it's still like, I'll just uh, keep, keep on going. Yeah, sure. Uh, here's what this case complex looked like in 2004. So there were just two different cases. And some people in yellow, some organizations in orange, and some case workers, right? And uh, this is like the, this is the economical plan and the... Um, and the, and the, and the, and the regulation plan. If you skip forward to 2011, you get a horrible hairballs like, uh, that are almost impossible to read, right? But here you can see that in this entire development, there were two caseworkers and two parties that really sent all of the emails. So it gives you some kind of an overview. An over and when you zoom, zoom in, then you can, you can see who they were and what they were working on. Now, the interesting thing with this is that that development is actually flat packed because it's all done by one by one de that developer, and that's why there are so few par par parties that are really that are really mentioned. And you can see that in that in that structure. If you do the same thing for my neighborhood, uh, 100, 250 meters around where I live, you get a different picture of this one architectural office helping people redo their sort of attics, and it gives you these sort of uh, these sort of uh, snaps. Or you could do all public cases with re with redacted correspondence, and you can see who is typically involved in that, right? So the issues with this is that these hairballs are really hard to read, uh, and that all temporal relation is lost, and that's really problematic with things like it, this because when you lose the temporal relation, you lose narrative, you lose story, and you lose understanding. So one attempt at this was trying to redo this with time. So what if we could do that? So one attempt at that for this area uh, again, it looks like, I'll show this in a web browser if I can. It looks like this. And this is bleached out, So, but these are circles. So here you see, this is a timeline that runs from 2001 to 2012. And these are the cases, and these are all of the letters that were sent. So you can point at each of these and you can go, okay, what happened here? Okay, first they had an economical plan, and then they had a regulation plan, and then someone put up a sign saying that they were going to build things actually there. And then they started to tear down shed number 15, 
<laughs> and then they started building a a garage, uh, and then the sort of the tower blocks started to sort of rise. So you get this idea of how this actually flowed. And uh, here you can both point out the parties and see when they sent and received mail, but you can also point out the at the individual cases and see who is who was in. Well, it doesn't come out really well on the, this per, uh, an ejector, but it works pretty well on actual mm -hmm. screen. So, and also here you can, I don't know if I have any, any internet now, but you can actually click on all of the cases here and actually get to the solution that the, that the municipality runs. So it's an it's a easy way to navigate into that also. Okay, I'm running out of time. So uh, there's one section here that I will just skip. <laughs> in, in, uh, good, right. So uh, there's one last, there's one last point uh, that I would like to be able to, to uh, sort of broach here, and and to have maybe later with some of you have a a a discussion on, because um, and it regards uh, privacy and public data and these data sets and how we should think of a. About them. Because when you talk about cities and data, there's all this talk of open, right? There's open infrastructure and open data and open source. And I have, I have at least when working with data sets such as these, I have a feeling that that might not hold. You might not want all of this to be open for all of the, all of the people all of the time. And the municipality of Oslo has made sure that none of the web crawlers see any of this, right? Uh, so it never ends up in the sort of Google. So one of the first things that I thought might be a good idea with this was to make a crawlable index uh, of it, give it all out to the people, right? And then one day when I was holding a sort of presentation about this uh, work, this woman came up to me after I was done, and she was in tears, and she worked there and had been evading a stalker for 10 to 15 years. And you might say that it's probably not a good eye. Uh, it's not a good idea to work in a, in a to have a place of employee uh, where your every action generates this uh, paper trail if that's your situation. And if you're into radical transparency, you would say, well, it's fine because everybody has, has access to 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 the to the same data. And if you have an issue with that, that's really your uh, your problem. But. I, I don't think it's that easy in any kind of sort of way, and I think and I and I told her on the spot. I said, "Was like, no, that's never going to happen, right? It's not happening." And I think one of the reasons that was such an easy, such an easy decision to make is that Norway has just been through this very strange uh, experiment with the serendipitous discovery of very sens 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 sensitive in information, because uh, Norway has public tax records. And that used to mean that you went to a room and looked at a book, right? And then the newspapers got, got hold of it, and you could, and you had to go to the newspaper site and search for what your neighbors made. And that was, and that was fine. And then at some point, someone in a, a, in a newspaper thought, think about all of the great traffic we'll sort of get if we just index all of a, all of a, a, a right? So this is my tax my income as clickbait, right? And that feels like this catastrophic sort of overreach, right? And I have a feeling that you don't want any sort of correspondence that you have with the public sector to end up like stuff like sort of this, right? Because that's what this, that's what a logical conclusion of some of this stuff is. Any letter you send, part of public, uh, part of the public record, something that someone can sell an ad on, right? So, sort of, in sort of clo closing here, I would like to say that ambient findability and serendipitous discovery are not necessarily good sort of things, but they do follow from the dictum of, of open. And at least in Norway, there's a really unclear gray area b between sort of where the Freedom of, of Information Act ends and where the privacy laws start. But what I'm sure of is that just banning robots from public sites isn't going to actually fix uh, this. So I think we should start having some kind of sort of discussion about how we want these public documents to be handled and by whom and, and sort of how. And if we need to have some kind of 
artificial scar scarcity that can sort of, because the digital do domains are completely free of any kind of sort of, uh, any kind of for richness. So maybe we need some kind of, some kind of scarcity. So maybe we need rules like anonymized in the, in the individuals and probable indexes or aggregation required for, for internet republishing or other such uh, things. So thank you.